cool. I think we're good to go. So thank you everyone for coming to my second workshop this quarter. I did one more last week and I did five over the summer, all different topics. Um, my name is Kirsten, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a recent environmental studies and Spanish graduate. Um, and I've been with adventure programs for four years. So this is not my first rodeo. Um, yeah, so I would like to start off by acknowledging that we are fortunate to be able to study and work on the unceded traditional and ancestral territory of the Chumash people. Much of the knowledge that I am about to share comes from traditional ecological knowledge preserved and passed down through thousands of years by these peoples. I hope that this presentation can do justice to that tradition of sharing knowledge about how to live off and protect the land, while also acknowledging that the original inhabitants of this land have been irrevocably harmed by those who arrived on their territory with no thought but to claim it for themselves. I realize that these are just words, but I hope that these words can create awareness and be a step towards future change. I'd also like to say that I um, did not intentionally time this with Indigenous Peoples Day, which was Monday, but it was a happy co coincidence. So, um, yeah, so today's workshop is on how the native Chumash people interacted with and used plants in the Santa Barbara area. Uh, one of the really cool things about Isla Vista is that the cultural landscape extends all the way back to when humans arrived at least 13,000 years ago. Um, I took an indigenous people's class while I was abroad and the number they gave us was much older, but um, I don't know that the American like anthropology system or history system, at least um, teaching what they teach kids, I don't think it's uh, arrived at that conclusion yet. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we can see evidence in the plant life and ecology around us of this 13,000 or more years of human involvement. Please feel free to type any questions, comments, or concerns into the chat, or if I invite you to turn your mics on, um, I'd love you to do that as well. I'm going to start us off with some background information. Oops, sorry. All right. So who are the Chumash people? Before the Spanish arrived in the 1500s, the Chumash peoples were mostly coastal hunter-gatherers with permanent settlements um, with population numbering in the tens of thousands. After the Spanish missionaries arrived, they were forced to abandon their languages, religions, and culture, cultural heritage like many other native groups, and many were enslaved, murdered, or died from foreign disease. In 1901, the federal government established the Santinas reservation located in Santa Barbara County. The Santa Ynez Band of Chumash Indians is the only federally recognized Chumash tribe in the nation, um, even though there were several other language and cultural groups in the area, and still are, but they're not federally recognized. Today, these peoples have overcome much adversity brought on them by past and present colonizers. The tribe is a self-governing sovereign nation and follows the laws set forth in its tribal constitution. They have cultural enrichment, environmental and other programs that allow them to share and teach their languages, histories, traditions, and more amongst um, their own people and others. What is today called the Galita Slough used to be a lagoon with an island in the middle um, on top of this island called Mescaltitlan. I don't know how to say it exactly, but <laughs> um, there was a large Chumash city called Halo uh, which was easily defensible and had access to all the great resources of the freshwater estuaries, as well as the nearby coast and ocean. In the 7,000 square miles around this area, the Chumash peoples hunted, fished, and gathered. There's also evidence that they cultivated natural plant ecosystems to increase yield of favored food and medicine plants. Their cultivation systems may have also included controlled burns. Um, the other half of my title for today's presentation is ethnobotany. What is ethnobotany? It's the scientific study of the traditional knowledge and customs of the people of people concerning plants and their medical, religious, and other uses. Devastatingly, most of the traditional knowledge that the Chumash people in this area have and had has not been recorded, and much has been lost due to the Western ideology that traditional knowledge is not scientific enough. Um, this presentation 
pretty much reduces plants to their purpose in relation to humans. But I just want you guys to know that I believe that there is inherent value and beauty in plants and other pieces of nature, not just what is useful towards humans. Um, but yeah, so I don't have a, I don't necessarily have an anthropocentric view of the world, but they're, what I am teaching does <laughs> have that view. Um, I wanted to start off kind of with a little description of some Chumash plant myths and traditions before I get into actual uh, plants themselves. Um, interestingly though, I learned that the Chumash, for, in Chumash myths, plants don't actually star very heavily. Um, they mostly focus on birds, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm not sure the reason behind that, um, but I did find a couple cool myths uh, to share. So the first one is their creation myth. Um, so basically like what they believe, like how they believe their people started and basically their earth goddess, Hutash, created them from seeds of a magic plant. So that's awesome. And then they have a myth surrounding the Matalaja poppies which grow natively in the area. Um, and the myth says that the gods made the soul of a heartbroken woman into the pure white petals of these flowers. And finally, something I can't go super deeply into detail about due to its sensitive nature. Um, like many other indigenous groups, the Chumash used hallucinogens for their spiritual and religious uh, traditions. They would drink some concoction of these plants um, to speak with their dream helper or spiritual guide. Um, unlike of some other indigenous groups of this region, the Chumash had much less restrictions, many less restrictions and rituals surrounding the use of this plant. Do anyone have any questions so far before I, or comments before I get into um, some examples of plants? You're welcome to type it in or um, speak out loud, whatever you want. Thank you. All right. So do you, I'm just gonna open up for you guys. Do you guys know any native plants with ethnobotanical uses? Um, it can be, let's keep it to California if possible um, or locally to Santa Barbara, uh, but you're welcome to annotate on the screen. You just go to the top where there's a little green bar, um, little green bar where it says Kirsten is sharing her screen. And then right next to that, just click the down arrow and you can press annotate. And then you can type in a text box on the screen or you can just share out loud or in the chat. Um, if you think back to like elementary school, when we talked about Native Americans for like three years straight, you might think you might remember some plants um, or think about any like fruiting plants that you see when you're out in nature. Okay, thanks, Sarah. All right, someone shared manzanita. Thank you. All right, well, chamomile. Yeah, so we, we do have a local plant in the chamomile family. Um, I'm not sure that chamomile itself is local, but we have pineapple weed, um, and that is that has some, um, it's edible and has some medicinal properties. Gooseberries are a good one. Um, cool, thanks guys. I'm going to go to my next slide. Um, thanks for sharing, oops. Sorry, I gotta clear this. Clear. All right, cool. So um, I've spent the last four years as part of the Isla Vista Ethnobotany Project where we have a collection of articles, maps, art, and descriptions of local plants that are edible, medicinal, and useful. So a lot of what I'm gonna share is kind of based on that or comes from that. Um, but I also have some other inclusions, um, other information from like other students' work on Ivy Wiki and um, some other people's stuff that they have online about ethnobotany. So 
I'm going to start with some plants that the Chumash used uh, from before the Spanish arrived. Um, this region has like nearly 1500 native plant species, many of which the Chumash found uses for and still use today. Um, obviously, I cannot share 1500 plants or even 100 plants, so I kind of just made a short list of some that I thought were cool that I could find easily. Um, I'm not even going to try to say the names in Chumash because I don't speak the language and I think I would butcher it horribly and they're not phonetic. Um, but at the very top of each of these slides, if I could find a Chumash name, I provided it. It's in italics and orange. Um, so mugwort is a pretty cool plant. I'm a huge fan. Um, mostly I've used it personally, um, based on like knowledge of Chumash um, tradition, I've used it to prevent poison oak and some of my friends have used it to heal poison oak um, like rashes. Um, and I've also used it as a good tinder source, but it's also been used historically by the Chumash um, for things like keeping away spirits, cleansing and promoting good dreams. Um, it's also can be used as a hand sanitizer, used to relieve tooth pain or headache pain, as well as other, um, as, a, as well as used for other symptoms of like menstruation, menopause, and asthma. So it's a pretty all around cool plant with lots of uses. My next one here I have for you is the lemonade berry, which you can find Honestly, all over Isla Vista, but definitely like in the restoration areas um, and Los Padres. Um, I think it's a super funky fruit that is both hairy and sticky and gooey um, and just sticks to everything. Um, if they're ripe, they have a pleasantly tart lemonade, lem lemonade taste to them, but they can also taste absurdly sour. Um, the Berries and leaves can be used for thirst avoidance. I'm not sure exactly how that works, but that is something I read about them. And the leaves and branches can be used to dye cloth. Um, there's also evidence that they've been used to relieve coughs and fevers. Manzanita, somebody talked about when, on the annotation page. Um, it's a great plant, it's all over California. There's actually a bunch of different species or subspecies of them, all from like the smallest ground cover to like huge trees. Um, some of these species are protected by like preservation and conservation laws. So just, so be careful when you, if you go out to forage, uh, those ones you actually are not allowed to forage from. Um, but the berries and flowers can be eaten raw or cooked, but keep in mind that the raw fruit is very dry and mealy and kind of like dusty. Um, due to this dry mealy state, it can be easily crushed into powder and used for soups, breads, and other things. Um, and the raw fruit can also be used to make cider. Sage is another good one. Uh, white sage is the one that we mostly see and talk about, but we also have other species like black sage. Um, there's a lot of different medicinal benefits from this. It's used to remedy night sweats and um, help aid insomnia, soothes the stomach, cleanses the blood and nervous system, alleviates symptoms of anemia, colds and flus. Um, the strong scent of it can also be used to treat headaches um, and it can be used to induce vomiting. I would not necessarily recommend using it for some of these. <laughs> Um, yerba mansa is another plant that the Chumash used. It can be used internally and externally. Basically, the root is dried and used in washes for healing cuts and sores, as well as venereal disease and coughs, and it's a blood purifier. Sagebrush is a cool one. It smells super good. There's California sagebrush specifically, but there are other species in the Southwest. Um, 
this has been used by the Chumash for headaches, coughs, and also possibly used in poison oak remedies. The wild rose is a good one. Um, when mashed in water, it can help soothe like teething pains for babies. And the dried and powdered rose petals can also be used like a talcum powder to soothe chafing and rashes for babies. Um, adults can use it as a tea, often um, mixed with other herbs to help like stomach pains and stomach issues. And You've probably seen like rose water used, used in aromatherapy for like relieving anxiety and helping you sleep. So the Junkish rush is a new plant to me. Um, and I thought it was related to Thule, but as far as I can tell, it's not. Um, maybe it's in the same family, but it's not in the same genus. Um, and apparently this is like the main weaving plant for the Chumash. They would like weave some really amazing tight woven artistic baskets out of them. They still do, excuse me. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty cool, but unfortunately this species is kind of threatened by modern development because most of their, the waterways that they grow in have been polluted or drained or paved over. And so it's actually really hard to find these plants to use for uh, basket weaving and other kinds of weaving. And the last plant that, the, that I have for you that the Chumash used before the Spanish arrived is Cyanothus, which is um, something I learned from a, I don't know, she wasn't my professor, but a professor was talking to me about plants and this is something she was telling me about. And apparently the Chumash use these, uh, the flowers of these as like a lather, a soapy lather. Um, but you can also use it in tea, the leaves in tea for treating coughs and colds. And the wood of some of the species is good for building things like fences or digging sticks or canoe plants. Alrighty, so the Spanish brought many things when they arrived, and some of them were plants that were actually useful. Um, and I've got three for you here today. I'm sure there were others, but um, the Chumash used ice plant, um, which is ac actually South African and probably brought over for erosion control. Um, but the fruits of these are pretty sweet and tasty. Um, My next plant here that was brought over is mallow. And mallow is found on pretty much every continent. Mallows, like plants in the mallow family are found on pretty much every continent. And they all have like, most of them are edible or have good uh, medicinal properties or both. Um, and so this one, the Chumash used you know, they ate it and they used it for similar medicinal uses as the Spanish did, like a tea for fevers, inflammation, and stomach problems. Pretty much the whole plant is edible. Um, certainly this type here, which is like malo officinalis. Um, and you can, I've seen this plant all over the place, everywhere. <laughs> um, and my third one here is rosemary. Um, in a similar way to how they use woolly blue curls, which I didn't include, but I should have in the presentation. Uh, but basically they made it make a tea from the flowers and leaves to aid the stomach. Um, and they use the leaves for like flavoring things. Um, there's also, it's also been used as a body and hair cleanser. Probably makes you smell better. I'm not sure if it is added to something else or if it actually cleans, um, but yeah. Do you guys have any more questions? I have some more plants to share that are like native and have ethnobotanical uses. So the likelihood of them being used by the Chumash is pretty high, but I haven't actually found information online about it. But um, before I get into that, do you have any questions or you want to talk about anything? Oh. Uh, 
I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> um, yeah, so some other cool plants that I have for you um, with ethnobotanical uses. Um, I do know that pickleweed was used by some indigenous peoples in California. So I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the Chumash used it. Um, basically, all the above ground parts are edible. Uh, they're very salty, though. Would not necessarily recommend them. Uh, blue dicks are a really cool uh, plant that have, like, bulbs, and they grow natively in California. Um, they're, I've never seen them in large quantities, but, you know, you'll see one over there and one, like, 50 feet away. Um, they're really pretty. I wouldn't recommend foraging for them unless you find a big patch or unless you're cultivating them yourself, just because they are usually pretty few and far between and we don't want to reduce their populations. Uh, but like indigenous groups would use digging sticks to get the corms out and they would kind of break the little pups off and replant um, the bigger corms of them, the bigger bulbs. And you can eat the bulbs and the flowers, I believe, as well. Miner's lettuce is a cool one. Um, super tasty. Like, it's, I wouldn't even consider it a bitter, although it's a little bit bitter, but you can make, like, a salad out of it. Um, they also are super high in vitamin C and have kind of a bunch of, like, medicinal properties or they've been used medicinally. Um, for like laxative, diuretic, and to treat rheumatism. The prickly pear cactus is a pretty cool one, super tasty. Um, you can eat the fruits and the paddles as well. Definitely you want to be careful because they're very um, spiny. I had a friend who did not properly get rid of all the spines and had to be had to go to the hospital because her tongue just got destroyed. Um, but some Native Americans, some indigenous people would use the fruit to make candy and chewing gum. And they would also use the sap from the pads on cuts, burns, and bruises. Somebody mentioned chamomile earlier. This is the, the plant that's in the chamomile family. It's called pineapple weed. Um, it's native to our area. Um, yeah, I mean, you can eat the flowers and leaves. It kind of has a sweet, like, fruity, tropical flavor to it. Um, and just like chamomile, it helps with relaxation, sleep, digestion, and colds. It can also be used as an insect repellent. So if you're ever looking for a natural insect repellent, the Oregon grape, I was surprised to see, has a dis distribution all the way down here um, in Santa Barbara area. And um, the, some indigenous groups would use the bark of the shrub to make a yellow colored dye, which is interesting since the bark doesn't look all that yellow. So I wonder how they figured that out. Um, another good one, everybody loves blackberries, or maybe not everyone, but most people do. We have a native species of blackberry that is super tasty, maybe a little tart, um, that I couldn't imagine it existing and people not eating it. So, <laughs> you know, uh, nowadays we have kind of an invasive, um, a couple invasive species like the Himalayan blackberry that are kind of taking over, but um, their fruits are like this big versus the native ones like that big. All right, tule grass. I know some indigenous groups use tule grass for weaving. Um, so maybe if the grass, uh, the um, rush we spoke about earlier was in short supply, it's possible that tule grass was another option. And there's other plants like yucca and some other um, reeds and things that could have been used for weaving as well. And I also included I know that the Chumash were seafaring and they lived coastally and they like moved between the islands and the mainland. So it's not a huge step to 
assume that they probably were eating kelp and seagrass and a bunch of other seaweeds and algaes that grow in the ocean. Just because there's so many of them and they're so like easily edible and good for you. Um, I could not find any information about the Chumash eating them though, unfortunately. <sighs> well, that is everything I have for you guys. Um, if you have any questions, I'll stick around for a little bit. My next workshop is next Friday on the 23rd at 12 p.m. It's about outdoor recreation in bear country. And I hope to see you there. Maybe if you enjoyed this, invite your friends. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for attending. It was good to have some people to speak to. I'm gonna turn the video off. Funny how.